All right. Uh, welcome to something completely different. This will not be the usual siesta on Saturday afternoon of fourth day. Uh, we're going to require that people stand up and circulate blood, move around, get their hands on our hardware, get their hands on our software, answer any questions that they have about what we're doing and how it works, um, and basically learn as much as possible in an afternoon. The format is that of a buffet. We have four stations here, four stations there, two stations up here, uh, with people that have various things going that I'll summarize briefly in just a couple minutes. And feel free to drift around and pay attention to whatever you're interested in. Ask questions, uh, sit down, get your hands dirty, uh, and learn something. That is what the purpose is right now. Um, we are also visited by one fallen soldier, Jeff, who's in effigy on the walls over here, uh, who is the greatest loss I can imagine our community facing, other than perhaps Chuck, uh, any time uh, in, in memorable time. He, Jeff, Jeff was the man. Uh, Jeff was the guy that I could give a piece of code to for our chips and expect it to come back half the size or twice as fast. Uh, it was wonderful to be able to work with him, and it's a tragic loss for us all. Uh, I'm just hoping that Jeff can, from somewhere, be observing what we're all doing and getting a giggle out of it now and again. At any rate, here's to you, Jeff. We miss you. Uh, we are also not visited by Michael Matvalishki this afternoon. He didn't stay away because he doesn't like us. He stayed away because he has the flu and thought that nobody would like to gather that from him today. So we miss you, Michael, too. Quick update on where we're at, because we told you about all our wonderful plans last year. Um, we, in fact, have done an evaluation wafer run, uh, a full engineering wafer run, as a matter of fact. Eight corner wafers, eight typical wafers. We've characterized them all. We've run them all. They all work, amazingly enough. So again, the, the scams that you hear from a lot of people in the industry that asynchronous computers are terribly difficult things to make work, that no one could possibly do it, is BS, and we've shown it to be BS. Not only do we work in all the process corners that our fab will let us get into, we work at all the temperatures, all of the voltages, and shortly we will prove that we work under other interesting conditions of stress. Um, we, we have tested our chips down to 73 degrees C below zero and up to 130. We know that the leakage gets terrible up at about 130. We could probably run for a while at 180, but the leakage is high enough up there that given the thermal resistance of a package like ours, which is still low, but still, you know, you're looking at 30 degrees C per watt, by the time we're leaking nearly a watt, we're going to be 30 degrees <laughs> higher than ambient <laughs> just because of that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. But at any rate, we've had a good time with that. We've proven that the technology works. We've proven that it works across all the variables that should matter in any realistic installation. And we're real happy with this as being a production quality chip. And so we are now offering them for sale in production quantities at production type prices. If anybody wants a price for anything from 100 chips to 10 million chips a year today, I will give them a reliable price quote today. If you want 1,000 chips, I'll quote you exactly when we will ship them. If you know anybody else who's interested in any of that, we are quite willing to answer questions like that. We'll give straight answers, and we'll follow them up with action. Yes, sir? One chip? Uh, you can buy that from the man over there in the hat, who is Neil. Neil Greenberg of Smartboard, Inc., who will sell you one chip along with one of his boards for 35 bucks. Correct? All right. So that's where to get one chip. The reason why we're not selling one chip is because our shipping department consists of all of our technical staff in Incline Village. <laughs> that's true. That's true. What we sell for uh, engineering evaluation is quantity 10. We think anybody that's serious probably is going to want 10 chips. But we could be wrong about that. Yes, that's right. Yes, correct. But that's that's really the answer, Gary, on that one. Um, we, we just can't afford to be shipping ourselves one chip at a time. We wouldn't get anything else done because we're just not set up for it. We don't have anybody like that. Nobody is getting paid still. Okay. So, hmm? my children are with my ex-wife in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they would be laying. But, but you see, my son would be laying out silicon by now, not packing chips either. <laughs> he knows how to do video games. Um, at any rate, um, and please break in with questions if you have them. Um, 
we've, we've accomplished what we set out to do in that regard. We have also designed two board level products, one of which is our um, prototype uh, test fixture, which will eventually go onto an ATE load card. This text, test fixture, we have an example over here for anybody who's interested in seeing it, consists of two of our chips that are responsible for testing a third chip in a socket. When we put those on a load card, that will be one socket worth of a four socket load card for like a Teradyne 750. So we do the testing at full speed, which allows us to run about 10,000 tests in a second, 10,000 test programs run in a second, um, and report results to the ATE, which will then handle materials and flip the chips in and out and keep score. But we can't afford to wait around for the ATE to run, uh, basically because the cost is prohibitive. If we take more than one second for that, it will significantly affect our cost for the chips and significantly affect our selling prices. So this is the prototype. What we've been doing to test chips is to run it manually. And, and so far, that's, that's sufficed for us. It's the same set of tests that we'd be doing in real life on the, on the ATE. So up, up, to, up to quantities 10,000, we can do it this way. Beyond that, we're, we'll need to go ahead and make the load. At any rate, that product has been made and it's been used. We also made the evaluation boards that we've been shipping all over the world along with chips. And so far, uh, no problems with any of them. We had uh, two, two bad chips that we bought from Cyprus, two bad memories, and one bad um, voltage regulator chip from somebody. Um, but nothing that we have uh, tested ourselves has failed on there, and we've had no other component problems, no fabrication problems. We've sold enough of the evaluation boards that we are uh, kitting out and, and starting the fuse now on the second run of boards uh, so that we don't run out of them. That would be a terrible thing. Uh, another thing that we've done during this time, and th those are the things that we guarantee that we do, along with developing software and writing uh, documentation, which we've do been doing as fast as we can. Uh, there's a great deal of documentation on the website now. If you print it all out double-sided, you end up with about a three-quarter inch stack, which is a good, good start for reading from anybody. And if somebody's read all of that and is hurting for more, they can come up and help us draft some more of it. That would be appreciated greatly. Um, we have formed a partnership with an interesting outfit called Smartboard, who is VP Marketing and Sales. Neil Greenberg is over here on the side. He is willing to teach how to operate the smart board system, how to solder things to it, and there will be more to say about that in a moment. At any rate, um, smart board is not simply a gateway to the hobbyist community. It's a gateway to a community of people that are, um, that are not necessarily sitting there with a burning need this, this week to light the fuse on some product, that they, uh, they, they, they're not sure that this is for them quite enough to want to make a large cash commitment. And SmartBoard addresses anybody who does not want to take and spend a humongous amount of money finding out how something works or building some little project or making a widget. Um, we can't, again, just because we don't have any staff, we can't afford to deal with people on a onesie twosies basis. SmartBoard is in that business. Great, wonderful. At any rate, the relationship exists only because of Neil's initiative. Uh, I bought some jumpers from him a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he went and looked at the website and said, hey, you guys want a board? So that was pretty cool. Thank you very much, Neil. You rock. Um, what we're planning to do this year is, uh, first off, we are moving the development platform onto the chip. That's why we did the polyforth port. Uh, the ability to compile F18 code, the ability to run the IDE, the ability to do simulations, the ability to do everything, uh, will not only be available from Colorforth running on a PC, but it will also be available from the host chip on an eval board. Uh, that is quite enough to act as a development system. It has a number of significant advantages over the PC, one of which is that the PC's bandwidth to our board is one megabit, whereas one of our chips acting as a development system can talk uh, synchronously at 20 or 40 megabits a second, or it can talk with the CERTES at 600 megabits a second, it also has all kinds of pins that are uncommitted that can be used for probes, signal generation, measurements. Uh, basically, we have a, a piece of test equipment that's there as, as the development system with high bandwidth coupling to a, a prototype one might be making. So we think that it's a good move to move the development system onto something that we can package small enough to put it at the end of a USB cable, and that's your development system. If anybody knows a really cool connector that someone made in volume and then stopped using, um, a multi-pin connector, like a 20-pin little bitty connector uh, that there's a warehouse full of someplace that's suitable for high-speed, low-capacitance, low-parasitics coupling 
from one device to another. We'd like to find that because this is exactly what our little development system would like to hook up to somebody's prototype with. You put the connector on your prototype, you hook up the development system, now you've got your logic analyzer and your um, super high impedance probes and everything plus the development system. When you're all done with it, you leave the connector off the board until the next time you change it and need to do anything new. And we think that's not a bad model. At any rate, that's where we're headed. Um, and we'll have that done this winter sometime. Uh, was, was going to be done at the beginning of December, but for reasons beyond our control, can't be. Um, so that's one of the technical moves. Another one is that we're generating appl application notes as fast as we can while doing all of this. Um, we think that the acceptance of a product like our chips is going to require a wide range and a rich body of application notes. So we've been gathering up bits and pieces to uh, write them from. For example, we have little GPS modules to talk to, I squared C and SPI. We're looking for all kinds of other little SPI sensors and things just because that's a good app note. You can say, here, look, here's how you can talk to this thing and figure out where you are and what your orientation is and whether it's light outside. Um, uh, SparkFun sold us some cool little <laughs> photovoltaic devices that put a high enough voltage out for a pin to read as to whether there's light on in the room, but don't really produce any current, but we don't need any anyway. And so pretty soon one of our little app notes will say, if your computer wants to know whether it's light or dark, here's a 10-cent you know, device you can solder onto a pin and find that out. Uh, we have some chip improvements in mind, and last year we thought we were going to be making shuttle runs, but that was because we were hoping that somebody would wander up, wander up and give us money. And somebody didn't wander up and give us money, and so we're going to have to earn it by selling chips. When we are moving chips, we will resume product development. We will resume shuttle runs. We have a bunch of improvements in mind. Chuck has designed an entirely new decode structure for our future computer. We have a number of things that we've identified that are places where right now, because of the way our architecture works, you would have to have a node spinning to resolve truly asynchronous phenomena um, coming at it. And we have a plan for how to avoid that need. And when we take care of that need, then that situation will cost 8 milliwatts less, and we'll be happy with that. So there are a bunch of these things that we need to we need to do, and we will be doing as soon as we can afford to. Um, and that's part of the plan for this year, we hope, because we'd like to find a few people that are buying enough of our chips to justify doing that. Um, on the business side, we are ramping up marketing and sales efforts. Uh, a, a major push is going to begin late this fall now that we're in a position to do so. We can quote prices and availability with confidence. We can show um, that we work under all the operating conditions that we should. There's no obstacle any longer to being able to seriously talk ab about uh, prototyping and seriously talk about product development with people. And so that's what we want to be doing. Um, we also have, have come to the conclusion that we have to have a very strongly articulated policy about continued availability of our chips. Um, it's, a, it's a perfectly reasonable concern. I was talking to a guy in, in Canada uh, last week who makes uh, serial boards for PCs, for all flavors of PCI buses, and he just got shafted by PLX discontinuing one of their glue chips. This guy's gone to all the trouble of ISO 9001 certifying his boards. His boards have then been certified by all kinds of law enforcement agencies all over Europe, and now he has to change a fundamental part in it and go through all, all of that over again, and he doesn't want to ever have that happen again. We have a strong policy. Our policy is we are not going to discontinue a chip unless it is economically essential to do so. And the decision about whether it is economically essential is one in which a customer works with us to draw that conclusion. By which I mean if nobody but one guy is buying a given chip and we have to make a wafer run, then we will disclose to him what the wafer run is going to cost and we will figure out a business arrangement to afford that wafer run with him contributing to it and getting a cut rate for the chips out of the deal. If we find that our masks are polluted and we have to pay a new masking charge, that's a lot of money. We will bring that to the guy and say, look here, this is what it's going to cost to make new masks. Do you want these chips bad enough to help us out on that? If so, we'll cut again a deal where the guy doesn't get screwed as a result if he's still buying chips. The ultimate place where we can't do it anymore uh, without a major investment is if somebody closes down their fab of the technology that we're using, and then we would have to completely redesign and requalify the same chip. At that point, the probable logical decision is, well, it's time to stop making the product out of that chip and use one of our newer ones, and we'll help you with that if necessary. 
But the point is that we are not going to do the thing that so many companies do, which is to discontinue a product because, gosh, we've got too many products, or, gosh, we don't make enough margin on this one, or, gosh, this, or, gosh, that. We will not ask an engineer to make a commitment. We will not ask an entrepreneur to base his company on something that we're not willing to provide to him until it is just absolutely infeasible to provide it to him anymore. And that, I think, addresses any realistic concern that somebody might have. Final thing is what happens if the business fails, or what happens if you guys are in trouble, or what happens if you're sued. Uh, we're again prepared to indemnify our customers completely by making it possible for them in a pinch to get the chips made without even us, if necessary. Not that I think that that's a realistic, like likely situation, but um, it's, a, it's a guarantee that you have to be able to make people. And we're in a position to make it. We don't have any, any bozos involved in our organization that will tell us we can't. So we will do what we would think is appropriate for good, happy entrepreneurs to feel comfortable using our chips. As weird and outre as they are, they will be able to get them as long as they want them, one way or the other. Price might go up because the cost goes up. That's it. So that's the nature of the message that we're going to be taking people this fall. You can depend on us. Uh, there's another interesting and exciting technical thing that we um, are going to do this fall. How many people picked up on the article in the IEEE Spectrum last May from an Intel boy talking about odometers for their computers? Okay, and he was talking about stress, cumulative stress. He was talking about hot carrier injection, which is the phenomenon whereby charge carriers become part of the gate of a transistor and don't leave. And this is a voltage-induced phenomenon. It has to do with the number of transitions that the transistor has made, and it mostly affects end transistors, and it affects them just on the way up when they're starting to conduct, but before they peak out. Um, what it happens is that it slows down those transistors, and it is a lasting effect. It's very nonlinearly a function of voltage. It's also a linear function of duty cycle. And this is a thing that, you know, Intel was all concerned about because, gosh, we have to derate these chips so that people can run the clock without having to worry about the chips not 10 years from now being able to keep up with the clock that you're running them at. Why don't we figure out how slow they have to set the clock to now and then make a way of measuring the cumulative stress on the chip so that they know how much to derate the clock by over time? Um, well, this is an intrinsic characteristic of Chuck's computer design. In fact, it is a topic that was addressed in one of his first patents called the optimum clock, where the clock was a ring oscillator or a delay line. Well, guess what our timing elements are? When we need to measure time, we use a delay line made out of inverters, just like a ring oscillator. Guess what Intel is planning to use for their instrument to measure cumulative stress on their chips to control the clock degradation? A ring oscillator. <laughs> okay, well, we have them built in. And so one of the things we're going to prove, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and put chips under stress at 3 volts. We're going to run one node flat out for several weeks until we finally start measuring degradation and start being able to put data points down on the curve. We're going to find out just exactly how much we slow down uh, for a given amount of exposure to that kind of voltage. Because we can do that to one node without affecting the rest of the chip, we can measure the differential effect between that node and the rest of the chip. So now we can instrument the bejeebers out of this thing. We can take measurements over various temperatures. We're told that you have to worry about this more at low temperatures, but nobody's given us any data. We'll get the data, and we'll publish the data, and that will be fun. The point being, though, that we will be able to show at the end of this falls data collection that even under the condition of accumulated stress, the computers just slow down, and only the ones that have been running at a duty cycle that would cause them to slow down, do they slow down. They don't stop working because we'll run all of our diagnostics and they will prove that the computers still work. The cool thing about that is that it allows a designer more degrees of freedom. It means that if you need a thing to run faster, uh, but at a low duty cycle, one of the options you have is to run VDD up. VDD up. Uh, the recommended VDD maximum by our fab is two volts. But actually, the punch-through voltage is 3.6 volts. And actually, you can take and, and run those things just fine at 3 volts. It's just that the degradation, the out-carrier injection, is dramatically accelerated. But it's a linear function of duty cycle. We can run at a 1,000th duty cycle if we want to. So what we'll be able to quantify is how much you can augment speed and at what duty cycle you can do it for how long before the thing starts slowing down. It's not going to break. It's just going to slow down. 
and we'll publish that data too. And that'll be kind of entertaining because nobody else has data like that. It'll be fun. They already licensed Chuck's patent. So <laughs> they can do it, <laughs> and so can AMD. <laughs> um, now, um, one other little matter about Green Arrays itself is that we have a special offer, a special wonderful offer. We have discovered a wonderful business model that probably no one's ever discovered before, and that is that when you run on slave labor, you can pay the bills with very little income. And having made this amazing, brilliant discovery, we're willing to share. <laughs> yes. So um, here's, here's a piece of information for anybody that's thinking about maybe taking a little sabbatical or vacation or something like that. Um, we would enjoy having someone who is interested in doing a project that leads to a good app note uh, come up and spend a week or two with us working on that app note, working on implementing whatever it is that the app note's going to be about, working on getting the app note turned out, making it a good, credible one that makes everything look really cool. And that person, in addition to a wink and a handshake and free food, well, free board, free, free room and a request to contribute on the food budget, but it's all home cooking, uh, is quite welcome to come up and work with us. And you can leave with an eval board of your very own without having to pay for it. So that's a way to make a short little vacation pay. Yes, sir, Gary? Uh, Incline Village, Nevada. Yeah, I have three spare bedrooms. It is the company flop house, and that's where the, where the room is, and the board is. We, uh, we like to cook Wonder Meat on a smoker and have a good old time. No, but that's, that is a serious, a serious request. We, a lot of us are tapped out on, on effort. I mean, a lot of us have been running on our savings or on Social Security or unemployment or whatever for the better part of three years now. Uh, and there are only so many of us who are available to generate app notes. It is going to take more app notes for us to sell more chips. I saw some things happening up here on the screen today which potentially would make really fun app notes. Right? Um, so if you're at all interested in that proposition, you're welcome to come and be a slave with us. Um, just talk to me about it later on. And that's enough said on that subject, I think. Keep an app note and go home with any Absolutely. All right, the story for the rest of the afternoon is that what we've proposed to do is to set up these stations uh, where you can go around and pick up on whatever you want to pick up on from how our chips work, how our software works, what our plans are. Uh, any damned question you'd like to ask, we'll do the Feynman model. You can ask us anything. We might not know the answer, but we'll at least accept the question. This is a buffet. There's no particular order in which one needs to go around the room. If you're not interested in what's happening at some station, please find another one that is interesting. I hope that there is something interesting for everyone here. In the front of the room, Chuck is going to be sitting here with your brand new wonderful approach to fourth, which is called, yeah, how about that? <laughs> so Chuck is available here to demonstrate, discuss, and totally reveal what he's doing. Dennis Roofer is over here. And Dennis Roofer is going to be um, walking people through what you do to fire up one of our eval boards. So in case you should happen to want one of our eval boards enough to buy it, um, you will be able to check out in advance the procedures for turning the thing on, making sure that it works, and know what to expect so that you don't have that miserable feeling of, God, what did I do wrong when you're at home? On this side of the room, in the front, is Dean Sanderson, who is operating the radio station KGA at roughly a megahertz, right? <laughs> yes, which is a bit banged radio, which eventually is going to be doing AM'd audio after he fixes it. <laughs> um, in the hat, again, is Neil Greenberg. Neil is prepared to let you sit down and have the experience of soldering on a smart board, we hope. Okay. Oh, really? Well, we'll see. We'll see. But the, Right, okay. No, we lost the... I've, Don, we lost the tip on that one. The tip is somewhere. It's not here. Um, the good tip. The, the pointy one. Uh, 
at any rate, the whole, the whole point of Neil being here is to explain what SmartBoard is about, what the products are about, what you can do with them, what their use is in prototyping, and it's pretty cool. Uh, Glenn has been very happy that he doesn't have to dead bug these little bitty surface mount chips to try and put together a little op amp circuit anymore <laughs> because you can get little boards from SmartBoard that allow you to take all of those SOICs and quickly and positively make contacts to them other than, you know, rather than tack soldering the dead bugs. Not a, not a pleasant thing to do. Um, if you have completed uh, your training with Neil, to whatever extent the training is feasible, Neil will lay on you two things, one of which is one of the smart boards for the GA144 and your very own GA144, which you may take home with you and assemble in the privacy of your own environment. Um, if you sincerely propose to assemble those two things, please go over and take advantage of this. Uh, if you're looking for objects of art to put on the wall, let me know. We have some dead chips. You're welcome to one of those. Right. When you are done with Neil uh, and have gathered those two objects in hand, if you wish, you can go find Don. Don, would you please stand up? Don Golding is taking names for a raffle of people who have been through the smart board process. And what he has in his hand there are 10 of the wonderful little SparkFun uh, FTDI boards for providing serial communications to your smart board with a 144 on it. Now, you can't run E4 or poly fourth with just that much, but you can actually fire up a 144 and talk to it with the integrated development environment using no more than what, he's, what, you, what you can walk away with there if you're one of the lucky 10 that <laughs> is able to walk off with a SparkFun board. So, thank you, Don. And down at the end is Skip Inskeep, who is not sick this year. <laughs> and who has brought his home apparatus for surface mount reflow soldering, which we're not actually going to fire up in here because it would stink the room up too much. But if you're at all interested in assembling uh, and, and doing reflowing, reflow soldering at home, that's one way to find out approximately what you can put together, one way to do it, um, to do it on a budget, do it without paying uh, surf, uh, surface art there, <laughs> substantial assembly costs. Okay. Um, Mark Smetter in the corner over here. Mark, who's sitting over there, is going to be over here. Did you get a power supply? Okay, we'll do that. Mark is, um, how many people here have ever seen the system that Chuck made for designing silicon with in operation? Okay. Mark is going to give anybody that's interested a walk through all of our design tools namely the layout tools, the way in which we describe the silicon structures that are being, are being constructed, and the um, actually analog simulator for those circuits that we use. The analog simulator runs with a time window of one picosecond, which is perfectly fast enough for this stuff, uh, and, is, and is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's how we've avoided screwing this up. Um, and he can also address anybody's interest in how we calibrate these tools so that they actually have something to do with reality. Believe it or not, you do not calibrate them by taking the numbers from the fab because the numbers from the fab have to do with spice and spice's peculiarities. They are not physical numbers. When they quote you a capacitance, it is a virtual spice capacitance, not a real capacitance. Same with the IV curves. So we have to go to a considerably different process to determine what numbers to put into the simulator. When, when we're done, it works. Simulator's accurate enough to, to make working asynchronous silicon with, which, again, people think is hard. Uh, next to Mark is going to be good old John Reibel, uh, who has been doing a lot of work recently with the soft sim tool, which is the one that will simulate a whole chip with all 444 computers running and all of them interacting. Uh, recently, John has spent a lot of effort on test beds, by which we mean the way that you simulate external circuitry plugged into the chip. And that is one of the concerns anybody that's going to do anything other than trivial algorithm, algorithmic work with the simulator is going to be wanting to know about. John is going to be able to explain how SoftSim works, walk anybody through setting up of, of test beds, and answer any other questions having to do with any of that. Bill Inch is sitting here with e running and is perfectly prepared to discuss any aspect of e its virtual machine, and what you can do with it and how you do it. Fair enough? Bill is also responsible for all the fine artwork on the walls. And I will be over in that corner um, prepared to uh, show you polyforth running on the chip 
prepared to show you anything you want to know that you haven't gotten from everybody else about our Rayforth tools to answer any other damned questions you want answered. Also, if you're interested in how we test chips, I have the software over there on the board that we use for doing the chip testing, and I can show you that stuff. Does anyone have any global questions that might be of interest to everyone before we break up and get started with this? Then let's go for it. We have until 4. At 4 o'clock, we will convene here in the center for Chuck's fireside talk. Yeah.